seminar, we looked at the household sector. In the second seminar, we were focused on community grids. Third seminar focused on schools and a solution for, for schools that's been developed by a company called Solar Exchange. And last week, we had a re really fascinating seminar on energy trading. And today, municipalities come into the spotlight. So I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker for today, who is Susan Mosdell. Susan is an environmental energy, water, waste and human rights legal specialist. She has a Doctor of Laws from Northwest University and she's based at the city of Cape Town, but the, her presentation today is going to be in her personal capacity. Uh, Susan, I know that you, you're actually an intellectual. <laughs> I'm really, really excited to hear your presentation because you, you come at it not only from an intellectual perspective, but also a very practical and situated and embedded experience. So Susan's going to be chatting about the sustainable energy work, sustainably, sustainable energy work on the part of municipalities. Before uh, I sort of end the introduction, I just want to say thank you, as always, to Magda Janse van Noordwijk. And Magda, uh, can you please just turn on your camera? It is the last seminar, so we can, everyone can see what you look like. Hello, everybody. Magda <laughs> is the star that has helped us, helped me pull all of these seminars together. I'm really, really grateful. And Reason, time for you to shine. Reason, <laughs> thank you, Reason, for your assistance as well. They have been absolutely invaluable in supporting me. And then to the Claude Leon Foundation that enables me to do this really interesting work. So just as a segue into the topic, until about until 2020, it wasn't clear whether municipalities could procure their own uh, generation generation power. There was around that time a court challenge by the city of Cape Town challenging Section 34 of the Ele Electricity Regulation Act, and that was essentially battered away. And the court said you need to use the intergovernmental framework to resolve this, and um, that was then done. So since about 2020, uh, when amendments were effected to the regulations under the Electricity Act of of 2006, municipalities have been able to procure their own energy to, to, to conclude IPP agreements. But as I think we hear today, they are both opportunities and hurdles. And then recently we heard there was this case uh, between ESCOM and a, a um, an energy, renewable energy service provider called Rural Maintenance. And then Mafube local municipality was in the center of it. They kind of didn't get, get involved in the court, in the litigation, but that case kind of just, you know, so opened up some of the issues that arise also when municipalities, uh, you know, the issues around um, equity and whether the whole municipality has been serviced and so, so on. So that's about the extent of my knowledge, Susan. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to you to, to enlighten us on the opportunities and hurdles that municipalities are facing. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Prof, for the in introduction. Um, I'm just going through the motions of sharing. Um, and I'm a little in the dark as to what I should be doing. Presenter mode, content only. Um, in. Um, I'm not sure, Magda and Reason, maybe you can help me. I need to get to my desktop to find the presentation to share it. So you could just switch between your screens. I don't know if you just have one screen or two screens. Yes. Um, so it's normally shift and control or shift and tab. If you can switch between, then you go to your PowerPoint. Okay. Um, shift and tab. Um. Okay. Then you can just put a presentation mode, the last little icon on the bottom. Yes. Um, the is slide that, should the I yes, that uh, not that one, that one, okay, is. that one, yeah, okay, thank That's you so it. much. 
sorry, I apologize to everyone for no being <laughs> technologically impaired, but yeah, we can now get going. Um, yeah, so as um, Professor Field indicated, we are talking about the role of municipalities in sustainable energy work. Um, it's been a minefield uh, in my experience, uh, and the law is still very, um, uh, let's say, it's, it, it's, it's not um, facilitatory of the work of municipalities. So today I'm going to spend uh, quite a bit of time outlining the hurdles and the obstacles that we face. Um, I use this terminology on purpose because some of the problems that we face are obstacles. Others are hurdles in the sense that we can jump over them. Um, it, it just takes time or effort or perhaps resources, money, etc. So as we go through, um, yeah, I'll try to explain which are, are obstacles and which are hurdles and um, comment hopefully on how we can move forward with renewable energy and energy efficiency work at municipal level. So this is the content of the presentation. It has eight parts. First of all, um, I, I deal with planning for sustainable energy work. Then I look into Municipal Systems Act procedures. And then thirdly, budgeting, which is very important and very often is an obstacle. Um, then procurement and MFMA processes. Then the various authorizations needed for sustainable energy work. And then um, how to undertake project management once your tender award has been made. Then a note on the ERA amendment bill, which is currently on its way through Parliament and how that impacts on the work. And then a general reflection on, um, on the presentation as a whole. So to start with planning for sustainable energy work. Um, as a point of departure, uh, we generally ask the question, and I'm sure all municipalities do, I know certainly in Cape Town it has been the case, um, do municipalities have authority to undertake energy work? And the reason this is a question is because in Schedule 4B of the Constitution, there's a reference to the energy-related function of municipalities being electricity and gas reticulation. And so the more conservative um, readers of the Constitution would say that um, that's all it is. You can only reticulate. Uh, you cannot generate or otherwise uh, participate in the energy markets. But now, um, nowadays, it's generally accepted and there's some court jurisprudence and there's um, a, a, a body of writing uh, where the Constitution and the Systems Act are read purposively um, and together these trends of thought um, have moved towards acknowledging the broader authority of municipalities to undertake various types of energy related projects. So um, understanding the role of municipalities in this way relates to looking at constitutional imperatives, integrated development planning, which is mandated under the Systems Act, and also service delivery obligations. And um, I'll just mention on the slide that there's been a number of court judgments where um, energy or electricity specifically provision has been um, acknowledged by the courts as being a fundamental municipal obligation. And then, as Prof mentioned at the beginning, um, in 2020, the new generation regulations under the ERA were amended. And they were amended to, to give authority to municipalities to procure or buy, that was the wording, procure or buy electricity from independent power producers. And that's something that Cape Town had been fighting for for quite some time prior to that. And um, it seemed like a massive breakthrough. And in fact, it is a massive breakthrough because it's, it acknowledges the role, more active role of municipalities in the energy market. But sadly, it doesn't mention own generation projects. So that, you know, the authority to undertake those is a little bit unclear still. 
but there are plenty of municipal power stations already in existence across the country and they are operating lawfully with NUSA licenses, etc. So it does appear that own generation projects are by municipalities are lawful. Um, so having looked at mandates and authority and, and constitutional obligations, the next issue to consider is what work to do, what projects to, to tackle and in what order. Um, so it's about, about firstly what work to do and how to prioritise the work that is going to be done. Now I think uh, at this point municipalities need to take a step back and consider what their objectives are. Um, uh, one objective is cheaper electricity for citizens. Another objective is climate change mitigation, reduction of carbon emissions which we're all bound to pursue. Um, another objective is load shedding mitigation, which is very tricky, as I will explain in a moment. And then also the provision of services to the poor. Um, there are still unserviced areas in most municipalities. And even where um, electricity services are provided to the poor, they are sometimes unaffordable. So it's, there may be an electricity connection in your house, but whether you have the monthly resources to buy electricity is another question. So on the load shedding mitigation side, I wanted to mention something which um, I think has been a, a, a somewhat a, something of a painful lesson for the city of Cape Town. And I know that other municipalities have struggled with this as well, including um, the one that uh, Prof mentioned in the uh, Frankfurt in the Free State. Um, where the kind of uh, fundamental approach when embarking on procuring of, of, of power is that if you introduce new sources into your municipal grid, then you would be able to mitigate load shedding. But that is not necessarily the case. In fact, it's not the case generally. Um, what we have learned is that only power generation that is dispatchable can mitigate load shedding. Now, dispatchable means you can switch it on during load shedding. It's, it's off the rest of the time. So when load shedding is, is happening, you supplement your, um, your power resources, and then you can say that the additional power is not part of your normal load profile, and you're introducing it specifically to mitigate load shedding. This works very well with hydro, a good example is the Steenbrus power station in Cape Town and gas to power projects are, you know, they are the ultimate dispatchable um, sources of power. So in the course of looking at what energy work to do, it's important to bear in mind that energy demand management uh, is a low hanging fruit and it always needs to be considered. Uh, considered, I, I should say, first in the line, because it is easier to save electricity than it is to build new, new facilities and to procure from providers. And then just a last comment on this slide. Um, Prioritisation of work is, in municipalities is often influenced by local government politicians. Um, some of them are very, very good champions of the work that needs to be done but um, they also have their own priorities. And it's a, sometimes a difficult scenario because municipal staff should not be influenced in their planning by, um, by the politicians. So there, there are always tensions in this regard. Um, and uh, municipal officials, generally speaking, should, um, should be the planners. Um, and sometimes there's a tension in this, uh, this type of scenario. So moving away from the planning um, principles to the Municipal Systems Act procedures, um, MSA requires that municipalities pursue developmentally oriented planning. And there's a de definition of development in the Act. It's described as sustainable development, which includes integrated social, economic, environmental, spatial, infrastructural, institutional, organizational, 
and human resources upliftment of a community aimed at A and B, A improving the quality of life of its members with specific reference to the poor and other disadvantaged sections of the community and B ensuring that development serves present and future generations. So energy is integral to achievement of this, the goal of um, developmentally oriented planning. It's in this energy planning is therefore a necessary component of developmentally oriented planning. Um, for energy planning to be meaningful, municipalities need to take a medium to long term view of the energy needs of communities. And this is inherently difficult because of the rapidly changing energy landscape. There's another factor that makes it difficult, which I haven't mentioned here, and that is the short term, uh, the short duration of the term of office of the political leadership. So to take a long term view when the political leadership wants to have quick gains um, is sometimes very tricky. Uh, and that there's a, 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 a tension and an awkwardness that arises from the situation. Now, there's some sections of the MSA that create, let's say, hurdles, not obstacles. Uh, and they relate to the delivery of the a review of the delivery of services. Now, it is certainly arguable that if a municipality is shifting from providing only coal based ESCOM power to providing um, renewable power from other sources, this that this would warrant a review. It would constitute a new service or a new new methodology of service delivery. Um, Section 77 of the MSA sets out circumstances where municipalities must review uh, service delivery for internally versus externally provided services, where new services to be provided when requested by the community and when an IDP review is underway. So an IDP review is underway every five years, so that, that, that is a regular process, and the others are more on an ad hoc basis. Um, and yeah, those are essentially the circumstances that warrant a review. And if a review is warranted or due, then section 78 has to be followed. Now section 78 creates a lengthy mechanism of a lengthy process of decision making, especially if an external mechanism is being contemplated, as may be the case where energy is being procured from IPPs, and um, the requirements for compliance with Section 78 are feasibility assessment, impact assessment, value for money assessment, consultation with the community and with organised labour. Now, I just make the comment there that uh, there are a lot of processes involved, but it is possible, albeit a bit demanding, to run all these processes concurrently. So what I'm suggesting is that a Section 78 process shouldn't be a step by step by step process. It should be an integrated process where all the requirements are, are fulfilled through simultaneously run interventions. So as I mentioned, the Section 78 investigation is very um, complex. It, um, it encroaches on a lot of areas such as future development, spatial planning, urbanisation, transit oriented development, technological development, climate change mitigation, etc. So there's a, a, a very high degree of complexity in doing this analysis. And this regime can thwart quick delivery of energy projects. At the end, I make the comment or I ask the questions whether it's observed in municipalities with regard to, to energy work. Um, to my knowledge at the moment, um, it's not observed. Um, although on a strict reading of the law, um, it, it probably should be. Um, we certainly in Cape Town have not embarked on Section 78 processes in our IPP procurement projects. Uh, we've, we've 
kind of assumed that uh, you know we we can get away with with not doing so, but it's questionable from a legal perspective whether that is a correct position. Um, well, I'm struggling to change to the next slide. Apologies, I, I seem to be stuck on the slide. Um, Perhaps just escape and go and go back in. No, that isn't working. Um, there we are. Um, okay, the next. Um, milestone, hurdle, obstacle, we'll decide which, which applies, is budgeting and development planning for um, sustainable energy. Now, development planning and budgeting have to mirror and reinforce each other because municipal expenditure has to occur in terms of a budget. So whatever is, is planned for must be backed up financially. And the municipal planning and performance management regulations under the MFMA require, as I beg your pardon, under the MSA, require a service delivery demand plan. Um, and thus, with regard to energy planning, a forward projection is needed of three years. And it must incorporate planning for population and economic growth and for shocks and stresses related to service delivery failure. And of course, ESKIM failure is one of these shocks and stresses which happens on an ongoing basis. And also climate change impacts must be taken into account. So um, this is also a very complex process. Um, and it, it, it must be undertaken by the energy departments in municipalities in conjunction with the finance departments. Finance department. Um, if you are going to have un urgent unforeseen expenditure, this is allowed in terms of section 29 of the MFMA, but it's not clear whether expenditure on resolving critical energy issues qualifies to use this provision. I'm not aware of it ever having been used for that purpose. And yeah, uh, as a final comment on this slide, I mentioned that the uncertainty about the state of energy provision, electricity provision um, nationally is a huge problem. It makes municipal budgeting and planning very difficult. And I think uh, when foreseeing what the energy circumstances may be nationally, uh, it's probably best and safest to work on worst case scenario. So anticipate stage six load shedding, etc. Now on the procurement front, a procurement of all goods and services is governed by section 217 of the constitution which says that it has to be fair, equitable, transparent, competitive, and cost-effective. And um, the MFMA and its supply chain management regulations, as well as the triple PFA, have to be, be adhered to by municipalities. And all, all energy procurement is subject to these legislative instruments. So I'm just going to do a brief outline of how the procurement process works and where difficulties may arise and where complexities arise. The first step in the procurement process <coughs> is demand management. And in order to undertake demand management, you need a bid specification committee in place to formulate the bid. And it's to formulate the bid as a whole and it, it's to formulate the tender as a whole and the um, bid specification. So ideally, uh, a bid spec needs to be clear and unambiguous. But this may be very difficult because of the changes and the volatility in the energy market. So what we decide we want today might not be appropriate in three years' time, it might be even less appropriate in 10 years' time. So it's a very difficult exercise. Um, it is possible to do an RFP, a request for proposals, rather than a conventional tender. 
But even here, you need to state the parameters of what you want quite clearly. Otherwise, your evaluation process becomes a minefield because you'll have a variety of different proposals coming in from diff different quarters. Um, it is also possible to do requests for information or expression of interest. Um, this may assist the tender specification process. It would precede the tender spec and the tender spec would be guided by it. But there are problems too with this process because bidders who contribute to the tender specification are precluded from tendering in terms of the SCM regulations. So choosing a process to follow um, to, to conduct a tender is a very, very tricky exercise. And once the demand management phase of the tender is concluded, it moves into the acquisition management phase. And a competitive tender is what is most commonly used. The first step in the process is advertising. Now, how and where you advertise and the response time you allow is within your discretion, but it must be reasonable and sufficiently long to enable the tenderers to prepare their bids. If not, you, fa you face um, potential complaints in terms of regulation 50 of the SCM regulations if the time is unreasonably short. Um, the second step is checking the bids for legal compliance. That includes um, tax, tax status and checking that the bidder or relatives are not in the service of the state, checking that the bidder is registered on the national or municipal vendor database. After administrative clearance, the bid evaluation process begins with the bid evaluation committee. Uh, it must be decided up front whether evaluation is a one-step or two-step process. If it's a two-step process, you evaluate functionality first, and then um, once that hurdle has been cleared, bidders who've passed over the hurdle are then assessed on price. Um, it's important to outline the scoring system very clearly in the tender document, and it must be formulated as clearly as possible. And that is also very difficult, um, uh, and it's complex. You know, there are a lot of criteria that can be applied in the evaluation, in the in the qualitative evalu evaluation, relating to track record, etc. Uh, and it's difficult to assess how much weight to attach to the various criteria that, that are under consideration. Then after scoring and evaluation, the Bid Evaluation Committee makes a recommendation to the Bid Adjudication Committee, which we call the BAC. And as part of this process, some municipalities do what they call a due diligence investigation into the bidder prior to going to BAC. Uh, this entails investigating the bidder's financial soundness and their credentials as set out in the bids, references, etc. Then after the BAC award, the unsuccessful bidders have 21 days to appeal the award in terms of Section 62 of the Systems Act. The appeal is to the accounting officer, who is the municipal manager or the city manager in the case of a metro of the municipality. And although this is quite a speedy process, it doesn't necessarily dispose of the matter because it can be followed by a high court review in terms of PUDGE, which must be launched within 180 days of the award. Now that is six months. So there's always a, a fear after an award, once appeals have been disposed of, that a review application might still come along and thwart the process. Then if the envisaged contract is for longer than three years, which a power purchase agreement typically is, Section 33 of the MFMA must be adhered to. And this involves a 60-day uh, notification period to the public, public participation period, and a mandatory consultation with other spheres of government and followed by a council decision. So this is also considerably lengthens the project preparation time, or the time to delivery, should I say, um, of a project. As far as authorizations go for sustainable energy work, as most of you will know, uh, a variety of authorizations may be needed. 
for example, an environmental authorization, a waste management license, a water use license, an air quality license, a land use authorization, and a heritage authorization. There are others as well. Um, these are just illustrations. Uh, it's important early on to scope what authorizations will be needed. And it's important to obtain them as early on as possible. But if, you, if your intention as a municipality is to shift the responsibility for the authorizations onto the service provider, it may be unreasonable to require them to incur expenditure to obtain these authorizations before they even know whether they're going to win the tender or not. It places a, a, a heavy financial burden and a risk on the tenderers. So this has to be thought through quite clearly and a streamlining process has to be has to be thought out um, as to where to fit where in the in the project process to fit the process of applying for authorizations. Then section 34 of the Electricity Regulation Act. Um, it is the one mentioned earlier, which provides for a ministerial determination to be given for new generation projects based on the IRP, the Integrated Resource Plan. Um, municipalities need to be aware of this and need to decide who must obtain the authorization, the municipality or the service provider, and when to obtain it. Um, in the new ERA amendment bill, which I'm going to refer to in a bit more detail later, the regime for Section 34 determinations has been considerably beefed up or strengthened. And the minister's discretion to determine all the elements of the project has been broadened. Um, I think we can, uh, with some justification, say that this may be an, a reaction by government to um, Cape Town's attempts to have Section 34 declared unconstitutional or inapplicable. Then as far as project management goes, um, a typical tender document has offer and acceptance provisions, and um, it may on its own serve as a workable contract on which to base project management, but it's very unlikely um, and uh, it's typically necessary for a comprehensive service delivery agreement to supplement or replace the tender document. So that's a, a, a task that would fall on a municipal legal department. Um, there are things that an SDA should cover, roles and responsibilities, special conditions, conditions of payment, penalties, issues arising during contract negotiations, work plans and timelines, deliverables and payment schedules and um, project governance processes. And of course, adherence to the National Treasury contract management framework is advisable to prevent um, any adverse repercussions and audit findings um, if it's not adhered to. So basic standards that come from this National Treasury contract management framework are to have a project steering committee, to minute your meetings, to have progress reports, site inspections, control measures in the event of uh, underperformance or delays, and checking of deliverables against work plans and, and budget. Um, yeah, so essentially what I'm trying to illustrate on this slide is that the work doesn't stop when the contract is awarded. Um, there has to be intensive uh, in engagement with the contractor going forwards. Now, as far as the ERA Amendment Bill is concerned, um, it is a groundbreaking um, legislative instrument. Uh, it establishes the, the Transmission Operating Company, SOC, uh, which is the first step in the unbundling of ESKIM, and it mandates it to be a transmitter, system operator, market operator, and central purchasing agency. So this um, bill is an instrument of electricity sector reform, probably the first in a series that will follow. But there are things about the bill that I find um, somewhat disappointing. The one is it strengthens the regulatory powers of NERSA considerably. Um, it really does enable NERSA to, I won't go into detail, but it en enables NERSA to 
to manage and regulate all aspects of of energy governance. Um, with regard to Section 34 determinations, as I mentioned earlier, DMRE is afforded much more detailed powers to determine various aspects of new generation projects. And this seems to be a firming up of the regime because uh, of Cape Town's attempts to establish its inapplicability to the purchase of power from IPPs. Um, the bill doesn't, this is for me the, the, the most disappointing aspect, is the bill does not address the powers and functions of local government in energy matters at all. Uh, local government is not mentioned or dealt with at all. So um, I see this as a missed opportunity. Uh, and also it's, it's incongruent with the 2020 reforms that took place, where local government was actively empowered to move into the energy space. Um, it's, it just seems wrong that it's not part of this current reform process that is underway. Okay, um, this last slide is a reflection on the various hurdles and obstacles. The first thing I mention is pricing risks. Um, typically, energy is procured via a long-term contract. PPAs are often 15 or 20 years. And the trajectory of ESKIM pricing over this period is unknown. Um, so it becomes very difficult to foresee how to manage pricing risks going forward. And there's a huge risk of committing to a pricing system that will become um, counterproductive or um, you know, not useful <laughs> going forward. Um, and this relates to the navigation of power purchase agreements, um, which, as I mentioned, are, are normally long-term con contracts. And it's difficult to know how to fix prices. And one way that one can do it is by um, providing that the price will be ESCOM price less a percentage. But this is not unproblematic because we have no idea where ESCOM prices are going in the future. We suspect they going to grow and grow going forward, but 20 years is a very long time to make a projection. And as far as undertaking power purchase agreements is concerned, municipalities don't have any experience at this and they need help and professional advice. And this comes at a premium um, and sometimes the advice is not even consistent. Um, as we have found in Cape Town, we've been struggling for uh, a while to finalize our PPA for our um, our first IPP procurement tender. Um, and it's largely because we've had contradictory advice from various quarters. Um, an example of what may be uncertain in a PPA is project financing may require that the off-taker provide credit support or financial guarantees uh, this is very difficult for municipalities to do uh, because they, generally speaking, shouldn't be pledging their financial reserves as security for a project. The financial reserves should remain available for uh, whatever they needed for on an urgent basis. So that is something that, that has to be grappled with. Generally speaking, the municipal fiscal framework doesn't fit with ongoing developments in the energy industry. For example, it doesn't fit with pooled buying and selling. It doesn't fit with real-time trading of electricity. Um, it's obviously formulated before any of these uh, phenomena came into existence, but it requires urgent adaptation. And the strict procurement law framework doesn't allow for easy participation on energy trading platforms. Now, uh, there's another, uh, finally, uh, an, another very good example of how unsuitable the legislative framework is for the needs of municipal energy work, and that is um, how to apply it to thousands of small-scale embedded generation purchases. All, uh, not all, but a, a vast number of municipalities are undertaking the purchase of power from embedded facilities, uh, typically um, solar PV on rooftops. But 
in terms of the law as strictly interpreted and Treasury do strictly interpret it, um, all of these small purchases need to follow a procurement process. Um, and applying the procurement framework to thousands of small scale embedded generation purchases from citizens is impossible. So I would say it's an obstacle. It's not a hurdle. It's 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 a serious obstacle. In Cape Town, um, there was an application to the Minister of Finance to exempt the SSEG purchases from the procurement regime. And it was unsuccessful. Uh, the Minister of Finance denied the uh, application for an MFMA exemption um, to, to enable uptake of SCCG without, uh, sorry, with reimbursement of, of customers. It was indicated, however, that, um, pardon me, <coughs> it was indicated, however, that if the um, crediting of the customer's account is taken up to the point where it has a null balance, that the offset against other aspects of the account is not considered to be uh, subject to the procurement regime. It's only when the account goes into credit and the customer has to be reimbursed that one is there then in procurement law territory. I think that's um, conceptually wrong. And I think uh, a change in the legislative regime to allow for these small transactions to proceed without any procurement process is definitely warranted. That's um, a good example of one of the difficulties that municipalities are grappling with at the moment. Okay, I've come to the end of the presentation. I'm sorry it's been a little bit wordy. Um, I hope that it's triggered a few ideas and thoughts and questions. Um, so yeah, we can move on then to take questions. Susan, thank you so much. Most enlightening, <laughs> most enlightening, and I think really giving us a sense of why things move so slowly. I have one comment, and then I've got three burning questions, but I'm going to leave the burning questions for others to ask questions first. But I, I, I am going to make a comment. You know, the, the whole framework around moving to the bid specification committee, then the bid evaluation committee, a bid adjudication committee, you know, the auditing of all those things. I recently wrote a case note on the Began case, which was a contract for water services. And that was a con that was a situation where the city of Cape Town wanted a contract for service providers you know, to provide various aspects of water services, but essentially delayed by more than three years. And then the, the contract kept on having to be extended, kept on having to be extended. So you have this, you know, having to work with you know, extending something and then sort of trying to patch, 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 patch. Um, and then at the root of it in this note, I've written that it's, it's this audit culture mentality that is holding us back, which actually comes from a deficit of trust. But that's that's just my comments on, you know, how why it's so detailed. I mean, I haven't also some thoughts about the the application of the procurement framework to thousands of small scale and embedded generators, which just seems absolutely, utterly ridiculous. But let's open the floor for questions and I'll hold my questions until we've had a couple from our participants. Please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Okay, while while you're thinking, my first question is around energy and water. So when you had the slide around the Municipal Systems Act and that section that talks about developmentally oriented uh, planning, and you mentioned about um, there's there's a whole you know, the mention of infrastructure and environment and all sorts of things. And you know, I'm wondering whether it's possible to disaggregate something like energy for water infrastructure from the general energy planning, because there's an interesting provision in the Water Services Act that talks about providing energy for water services, treatment facilities being part of water services. Because, and, and also when you spoke about the service delivery plan for three years. So, you know, 
what we've seen at the municipal level is a kind of cascading disastrous situation because as the municipalities don't have energy, they can't run their water treatment plants and you can't treat the water properly and then you can't run the wastewater prop uh, uh, treatment prop plants properly and then there's massive pollution and then that makes it more difficult to treat the water so there's like this vicious circle. So there, is there any kind of thinking in terms of just providing energy for a municipality to procure just to provide energy backup solutions and also battery energy storage solutions for these water treatment facilities. Yes, that's a very interesting question. Um, and I do agree that uh, in terms of the legislation, as you mentioned, it is possible to disaggregate um, energy for water facilities from other energy. And certainly it should be, it shouldn't be that water purification plants and uh, water treatment plants uh, experience load shedding and malfunction because of that. Um, I'm not aware of any initiatives uh, in, 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 on a broader scale to sort out a separate energy management system for water. Um, I, I think it would be a very good idea, as I, as I said. Um, there are initiatives underway in Cape Town to provide um, battery energy storage for, for water plants. But like everything else, with the procurement laws and um, uh, you know, general municipal fiscal processes, uh, they take time. So there's nothing in place that I'm aware of as yet. I think it's a space that, that warrants um, further development and investigation. And maybe those of us who, who look at it from an academic an, uh, angle can um, can offer some support and encouragement to municipalities and possibly via Salga to to provide a, a sound legal argument for for moving in this direction. But yeah, it's 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 a developing space as far as I'm aware. Okay, I'm so glad you think it's a good idea. Great, Peter, you have a question. Um, yes, the issue of dispatchable power. How does this go in? Is this only in the case of doing away with load shedding? And in which case you couldn't use it at any other time to augment the municipal power? Or is it only if you uh, that is applicable if you are giving it as a uh, a counter to load shedding, or is it a general provision that precludes the use of it? Thanks. Sorry, I'm just trying to unmute. Um, yeah, uh, dispatchable power is um, the only way to circumvent load shedding or to to mitigate against load shedding, and that is because of the way that. ESCOM um, uh, regulates, it, it's because of the way that ESCOM conceptualizes the ordinary load profile of the municipalities. So if you have something that is permanently feeding into your, your electrical grid, it's not dispatchable, it's there all the time, then uh, it's considered part of your normal load profile and it is load shed along with everything else. So, yeah, that's about the limit of my understanding of it. I'm not sure if I understood the question quite correctly. Um, dispatchables are, um, yeah, uh, there's not much more I can say. Dispatchables are, are, are uh, power that is there in reserve for the mitigation of load shedding. It, were, were there other aspects to the question that I didn't um, didn't address? I think you probably have addressed it, but it's a question. We're looking at the possibility of getting independent power in to the municipality, um, primarily to counter or mitigate against load shedding. But I was wondering if it then is the case that it wouldn't be allowable to augment your normal power using that independent system? 
Yeah, it, I mean, you can augment your power, but it, it won't save you from load shedding, unfortunately. Um, there is a, I was reading in the news uh, this morning, in fact, that the city of Chwane is planning to uh, to introduce, to refurbish some old power stations. And, um, and the, this will be done via some deals with the private sector and they will introduce new power onto their grid and they want to use this to mitigate load shedding and they are going to challenge, or so they say, they're going to challenge the regime whereby um, power We've lost you, Les, uh, Susan. Susan, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, I was sorry wondering for a moment if it was me or you. I, I'm <laughs> muted for some reason. I don't yes. think I, I muted okay. myself. You, uh, you were at the point where you were saying that they're going to challenge. It was like at the most suspenseful moment. Oh, yes, okay. Um, Chwani is going to challenge this regime, um, which was this, the, the subject of the uh, the Frankfurt load shedding mitigation case. They have said that they they want to use the additional power that they're introducing via the refurbishment of these old power stations, and they want to use it to mitigate load shedding, and they believe that the regime is unlawful and unjust, etc. So uh, there will be a legal challenge um, coming in the future. But at the moment, Eskom's view is that their grid code says and uh, that only um, the, a normal load profile includes everything that is normally fed into the grid and all of that has to be load shed. The structure of the grid code. So uh, my second question, Susan, is, you know, in terms of the service delivery demand plan that has to be pre prepared in terms of, I think it's the Municipal Systems Act, you, you spoke about Sort of projecting what's going to happen with ESCOM, but what about you know all the developments that are taking place in the private sector? Because mm. as as it is taking so terribly long to get things done, people are just finding solutions for themselves. And mm. you know the figures this year of something like four trillion rands worth of solar panels imported, um, Standard Bank's home loan book twenty almost thirty percent has solar panels. So is that also factored into the decision making, the trends in the private sector? And there's also, you know, research on sort of concerned about the impact on municipal revenues. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, um, I think it certainly has to be. Um, I think most municipalities are aware of um, migration from the grid and how that will change the demand profile. Um, so the big uncertainty is Eskom and, you know, whether we can still get enough power from Eskom going forward or not. Um, and uh, But as you say, the private sector has taken the initiative um, to, to move towards own power generation. Uh, and this is certainly a factor. I know it worries the, the, the financial um, energy planning experts in the city of Cape Town uh, quite seriously. Uh, it's a ticklish exercise. Um, and uh, obviously loss of revenue is, is a component as well. Um, so, you know, forward planning for future demand and future revenue streams and, and future tariffs, in fact, as well, um, is a very um, convoluted and, and tricky exercise. But private sector involvement has to be a factor. And I'm, I'm sure you've I'm sure you saw the, the seminar last week where we had, we hosted Des Williams, who's offering a solution that seems pretty fantastic uh, around, so essentially aggregating those small scale generators, at the same time offering an energy demand solution. So that's, you know, that's the value add of the energy trading proposition, which is energy demand reducing uh, a, a household's bill, and then they get access to a trading, a trading um, device, which is then aggregated and sold to the municipality. 
So I just, um, I don't know if you uh, you saw that that uh, seminar, but it just seemed like a, a really innovative and creative uh, way of, and that would that would be a, a hurdle around a way around the obstacle of uh, the application of the procurement regime, because then you're not dealing with thousands of small scale embedded generators, you're dealing with a, a single trader who aggregates that uh, that generation. Yes, unfortunately, I didn't. I haven't seen the seminar yet. But um, aggregation is something that we've been looking into in Cape Town, and it certainly is a way of lumping things together um, so as not to have to procure from thousands and thousands of individual suppliers. But um, of course, we still have to procure the services of the aggregator. Um, and the aggregator must in turn have some methodology in place whereby he acquires the services from from the individual generators. So it's not without its complexities, but it is it certainly will ease the pain of having to to go through uh, a full procurement process with each small scale generator um, customer. So he said, uh, I agree that that is a mechanism that can be used. My experience um, uh, which I, I have limited limited exposure to aggregation and aggregators, but um, I think it's very much an emerging um, facility. I I um, I don't think they're commonplace, um, and I, but I'm, I do believe there is a role uh, role for them going forward, linking up with municipalities. We have another question, and then there was also a question in the chat. So, DW Guest, please go ahead. Um, hi, Tracy. It's uh, Desmond here. I've just got a question. Oh, Desmond, for I was just talking about you. <laughs> I heard, I heard, just before my question. I just wanted to, to find out, well, firstly, thanks, Susan, for the presentation. Very insightful and very informative. I just wanted to find out, with your work in Cape Town, have you guys taken a view on... Call it uh, this. Call it use of systems, which could be a challenge and an opportunity for for municipalities where they could generate new revenue. Uh, what view have you guys taken on how to fairly price that? Because municipalities traditionally are used to just using it in one way, kind of to receive the power and then distribute it. And now there's an opportunity for them to kind of rent the distribution grid out. Uh, what's your take on on that in terms of monetization? and just democratization of that system, uh, even for IPPs and traders to use. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we've been looking, I think what you're describing essentially is, is wheeling. Um, and the city has a, a wheeling pilot program underway at the moment. Uh, we take the view that we must allow wheeling across our grid. We must, um, we can monetize it because we do have a wheeling tariff, albeit not NERSA approved because NERSA reckon they don't have authority to approve a wheeling tariff, but that's another story. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in, in Cape Town, certainly we, we are moving in that direction, monetizing um, the use of our system, allowing it broadly without in a non-discriminatory way, which is what is required in terms of the ERA. Um, so yeah, we we're heading in that direction. It's it's very complicated though because of the municipal billing systems, as you say, have only been um, configured in one particular way up to now, and um, there's a lot of reconfiguration and new 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 software writing that has to go into tr um, transactions of this nature, which Cape Town is currently working on. Um, I would imagine that other Certainly other metros are doing the same. So yeah, we the answer is we're getting there. Okay, thank you. Des, do you have any no follow up? Uh, no, 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 it's fine. Uh, thank you. And the other thing that I thought was really remarkable about your proposition last week, Des, was that that this clause about uh, when when people, the small scale embedded generators get the return, they must actually use it to pay their municipal bills. I thought that was a really yes. clever. Yeah, so that's you, um, so yeah, that's so, the sweetener. So, so you don't have to have roadblocks to, to get people to pay rates. 
Yeah, so, yeah, no, no roadblocks. But what you could do is almost close the system financially, right? Where if you are trading within a particular municipality, you tap into the Rates and Taxes Act, you, you tap into the, um, is it C, the MSA, the Municipal uh, Finance Management Act, and you kind of protect the first case. So if you've generated 5,000 rand, what you can do is procure municipal services with that money. And in that way, you don't have that much loss of municipal revenue and it kind of stays protected and closed within that loop. Um, so yeah, those were some of the recommendations that we had for yeah. for yeah some of our, some of our proposals. Yeah, that is actually allowed in terms of the uh, accounting systems that municipalities follow. Um, it's a consolidation of accounts is allowed. So um, that is why your uh, credits for your, your renewable energy are set off against other municipal debts. But we have to envisage scenarios where people will uh, will generate more than they use. And we're going to have to contemplate paying them. And that's where the difficulty comes in, because that is considered to fall within the procurement regime. Paying them in actual cash. In actual cash, yeah. Our mayor has pledged to make this work in Cape Town, but we haven't been able to achieve it as yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting, interesting. Thank you so much. Um, there was apparently a, a question in the chat. Can we deal with that? I can't see the chat. Yes, I've been I've been talking I've been talking on mute. <laughs> From Sheikh of Fatsil, is there legislation regarding renewable energy and IPPs and how much they can add to the grid? And prior to being awarded tender, should a business have health and safety authorizations, or are these done as a tender is being awarded? So that question, and then I have an additional question around so I recently went through the exercise of of trying to you know this process of looking at the price and is it worth it if you look at the price going forward 20 years and the kind of assumptions you make about escom's price going up which you know it's looking like looking into a crystal ball is there any thought about linking the price not to escom but to the price of carbon you know if you look at some of the the esg work that's uh, big mining companies are doing around the projects that they want to take on to shift the dial instead of so they're adding the price of carbon to those evaluations and that is then making it very clear that the renewable energy project is is better so is it possible to replace the price of ESCOM power with just a price for carbon um yeah, I'll try and answer the first two questions first, although I, I may need to ask you to repeat the second part. As far as uh, legislation governing IPPs is concerned, um, you know, historically with the REAP program, um, government did all the procuring um, and uh, there was no scope for uh, IPPs to, you know, to of their own accord market their, their, their power. Uh, they only responded to the government tenders. Now, I think things are busy slowly changing over the course of time. Um, the problem is that the legislation still allows the minister, this is section 34 of the ERA, but it still allows the minister to determine all aspects of a, an energy transaction, including who the buyer will be, what the source of the power will be, etc. So even IPPs embarking on um, the sale of energy uh, to to other members of the private sector, they still have to go through that decision making and uh, determination process. So it's theoretically more open now than it was, but it's still very constrained by Section 34. Um, the the second question was about health and safety regulations, and I I, I I didn't quite quite capture it. I think that was similar to your slide about authorizations about yeah. needing to obtain them before and shifting that oh. onus onto the service, onto the tenderer. Yeah. yeah, there's no law around when and where to obtain your authorizations. And that's why it's an essential part of project planning. Um, and one has to foresee or know or have some idea of how long it will take to obtain authorizations and plan accordingly. Um, 
generally speaking, health and safety would be the obligation of the contractor or service provider because that, the contractor company is, is in charge of, um, you know, the, the operational and health and safety related functionality of the project. Um, I think in Cape Town, our IPP tender says clearly that um, health and safety matters are the responsibility of the tenderer. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Sounds good. And then, and then um, on the assumptions about pricing or, or, or inability to make assumptions about pricing, it is very tricky indeed. Now, um, using carbon as a as as a, a metric, I think that's a very interesting idea, and I haven't actually dealt with that before. Um, uh, of course, at the moment there is no no law, no strict regime around um, who owns the green benefits of renewable energy. Uh, that has to be negotiated or determined contractually between the parties. So, yeah, there certainly is scope for developing a new regime to use the carbon as, as, a, as a pricing instrument. Um, but uh, at the same time, you know, I'm not all that certain that <laughs> carbon pricing is going to follow uh, a, a kind of um, predictable path going forward. Um, I, I think to a large extent, this, the kind of heyday of pricing carbon is, is kind of slipping by. Um, and there's so much variation across the world in, in various governance regimes as to how carbon is priced and dealt with. So it, it, it certainly wouldn't be an uncomplicated system to, to, to implement, but a very interesting idea. Okay, are there more questions? It seems like we have, okay, so it seems like we've come to the, um, there aren't any more questions. I suppose the, the, the oh, there's Julia Taylor. Julia, please, you've been very quiet in all these seminars. Please state your question. Thanks so much, Tracy Lynn. Um, I just, I had uh, one question about, I don't know if I missed it, but this, this kind of denial of the city of Cape Town um, on the MFMA exemption um, by Treasury or Minister of Finance. Mm. Is that was there? Did they explain like why why it was denied and if um yeah any more kind of information about that and then also um I might have missed it in a um you know in the beginning of the session sorry I joined a bit late or but I guess I wanted to know kind of what is the standard is the experience in Cape Town quite similar to other municipalities around these regulatory things or is there are there any differences between municipalities that you know of. Thank you. Yeah, as far as the denial of the exemption is concerned, um, no, it, uh, we gave ex an extensive detailed rationale for wanting the exemption, but the response that came back from the Minister of Finance was simply that it is not granted. Um, he did, as a sort of a, a conciliatory measure, he did suggest that there's, we could possibly expedite the Section 33 process. Um, and he suggested that we build it into our ID, annual IDP review. Um, that's not very helpful because that only happens annually. Um, so we, we haven't followed that advice. He did grant us an exemption in terms of Section 3 of the Triple PFA, and that is the section that says that a, a bid must be awarded to a single bidder so that we can now um, we can go out on tender and award to multiple bidders. So that helps a little bit. But generally speaking, no, there was no rationale given for Treasury's position. Um, Contrary as, to the principle of administrative justice, I just might add. Well, yes, uh, we, we we were thinking of asking for reasons and going on review, etc. But in, uh, instead, we've chosen to follow a more conciliatory approach and, and try and persuade Treasury once again via a different channel to uh, to consider the exemption. Um, 
yeah, as far as standardization is concerned across metros and, and municipalities, um, I, we do chat, uh, those of us in Cape Town do chat periodically to officials in other metros. Um, they tend to be a little bit less um, compliance phobic than Cape Town is. Cape Town is very, um, uh, you know, as, as there was a reference earlier to a, um, a, a audit culture, uh, Cape Town is very driven by that. So before we do anything, we tend to ask, can we, um, how do we do it compliantly, etc. cetera. Um, whereas other municipalities sometimes just do the things that we're asking questions about. Um, and that's uh, that's always been a, a source of concern to me. But um, yeah, I mean, the problems are uniform. Um, whether they're considered with such seriousness all over the place is is a different matter. Thank you so much. This has been very, very interesting. Uh, absolutely fascinating to kind of get into the, the innards of a mun municipality, Susan. Uh, really, I'm grateful. And then I suppose, you know, it's it's still looking forward to next year and the national elections and what that will bring in terms of changes at the national level and releasing us from the stranglehold, firstly, of Section 34 and of ESCOM's grid code. So. I think exciting times are ahead. This is uh, a very fast moving space. Uh, so I think what might shift quite dramatically. Yes, I'm hoping that the somewhat bleak picture that I painted today is, is not going to be, um, you know, the, the way things are going to work indefinitely. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there is, there are, there, there's ongoing lobbying that is, is taking place via um, Salga and via the city's support program to try and free things up for municipalities to play a bigger role in um, in electricity governance and energy governance generally. Okay. So hopefully that that will start to bear fruit. Great. Okay. Wonderful. So with that, I'm going to close. Uh, thank you today. Thank you to everyone who joined. As as always, it's been a really interesting, rich engagement. And that with that, I close our renewable energy seminar series. And my next series, which will be next year, will be on political parties' positions on water. So, Magda, <laughs> get ready for that. <laughs> but we'll do that closer to the national elections. It's been really wonderful. And all of this, all the, the recording is posted on LinkedIn. You can access everything there. And uh, Magda does normally send it to all participants. So thank you and have a great day further, everyone.